In this lecture, I want to look at measuring activities and other thermodynamic quantities, taking advantage of electrochemistry. So uh, first off, let's talk about predicting cell potentials. And so let's consider a full cell, and one that we've seen before, actually. The full cell is silver chloride, an insoluble salt, insoluble in water, that is, so solid, plus one half hydrogen gas in equilibrium with protons, chloride ions, both in aqueous solution, and solid silver. And the standard potentials, which we could look up in a table, are 0.222, and by definition, zero for these two half cells. And so the net standard potential for this full cell is 0.222 volts. However, let's say that we constructed the cell not with everything at unit activity, right? That's what the potential would be. That's what the standard potential refers to. What would be the potential observed when you put a potentiometer in the wire between the two half cells if everything is at unit activity? But we might construct our cell for convenience having modified some of the concentrations. So for instance, we might buffer the pH, buffer the pH to 7.0. And remember that means a concentration, and for the moment let's just simplify things and assume that the concentration is the activity. Uh, pH 7 is 10 to the minus seventh molar. Unit activity would be one molar. One molar would correspond to a pH of zero. So there's a big difference between pH zero and pH seven. That's a lot of acidity, pH zero. So lots less proton, and maybe we'll buffer the chloride anion at 10 to the minus third molar. Again, unit activity would imply one molar, so we've got substantially less proton concentration and chloride concentration on the right-hand side of our reaction. And the Nernst equation tells us how to predict what the, the full cell potential will be under those conditions. Namely, it's the standard state potential minus RT over NF, and N in this case is a single electron in each of these two half reactions, so I've, I've indicated it with a one. Log all the different activities, and again, remember that the solid silver, the solid silver chloride, the gaseous hydrogen, they're all unit activity. So all I have to do is plug in, here's the gas constant R, Here's the temperature, 300 Kelvin. Here's the Faraday constant. Uh, the one is still implicit there. But now I have log of, what's the activity of proton? It's 10 to the minus seventh. What's the activity of chloride? It's 10 to the minus three. So here are all these other ones. This term is not zero. In fact, it, it corresponds to a relatively large negative number, which is preceded by a minus sign. So it contributes positively so that this cell has an overall potential of 0.817 volts. And remember, the larger the positive potential, the more negative the free energy of reaction. So it says that by buffering the solution to pH 7 and 10 to the minus third molar chloride, we've got a lot more driving force for electrons to go from left to right. And that makes sense, right? This is sort of a Le Chatelier's principle. We reduced the concentrations of these species on the right-hand side of the equilibrium, and so there is much more of a tendency now to try to flow towards that side. There's more spontaneity, more negative free energy associated with that. So stronger positive driving force than the standard potential because two of the products are at lower than unit activity. Well, this actually gives us a tool, in fact, to determine activity coefficients. So in chapter 11, I described a, a relatively old school way to go after activity coefficients for uh, non-electrolytes, and then I alluded to potentially using it for electrolytes as well. And that involved measuring changes in vapor pressure, taking advantage of the colligative property of osmotic pressure uh, affecting the uh, the activities of vapor phases. So measuring cell potentials, though, is still more convenient when we talk about electrolytes. So for example, for a one-to-one -one electrolyte solution, I would be able to write my Nernst equation as the actual cell potential is the standard potential, minus 2RT over F, and I've got one-to-one, -one, so there's a one hiding in there for the number of electrons. I'm assuming a, a singly charged species. Log of the molality, plus log of the mean ionic activity coefficient. 
So I can rearrange then to solve for the log of the mean ionic activity coefficient as shown here. And that means I, I look up my standard potential, I make my cell with given molalities, measure its potential, and I know what log gamma plus minus must be. And so here's an example of doing that for a couple of different salts. So I'm measuring variations in cell voltage. I know this number. I know this by construction of my solution. And I'm able to determine gamma plus minus. And what you should notice, so there are uh, two different salts that are being uh, measured here. One is aluminum trichloride and one is aluminum sulfate. And so up here are the aluminum chloride numbers. And you see that at very, very low concentrations, so this is in concentration, at very low concentrations, the activity coefficient is going to zero, as it should. You approach ideality at, at infinite dilution. Uh, it drops to a negative number, levels for a while, and then starts to decrease in magnitude. And that's now up to a, a quite concentrated solution. Aluminum sulfate, by contrast, drops much more precipitously. Still uh, asymptotes to zero because infinite dilution has to be zero. But it drops very, very steeply, comes down to a much larger negative value, plateaus here for a while. Looks like maybe it's starting to creep a little bit back up. We expect this much larger non-ideality. So the magnitude of the activity coefficient is telling us about non-ideality. We expect this to some degree because the sulfate ions are doubly charged ions, not singly charged ions. So the larger the charge, the more the non-ideality. And indeed, it's a, it's a good point to think about this in a little more detail. The, the self-assessment is as the concentration approaches zero, as we're coming in on these asymptotes, what should the relation between the slopes of the two activity coefficient curves be? And I'll just offer a hint that probably debye huckel theory is going to be your friend here. All right, here's the explanation for this problem. Uh, I'm not going to go into this one in detail. We've done debye huckel theory examples before. I think it should be pretty explanatory. You can take a moment with it, and then we'll continue. Up till now, we've focused on free energy and its relationship to standard potentials. But let's talk also about enthalpy and entropy. So the relationship between the free energy of reaction and the cell potential actually lets us measure standard enthalpies and entropies from looking at variations in cell potential as a function of temperature. So for instance, we know that the entropy of reaction is minus the partial derivative of the free energy of reaction with respect to temperature at constant pressure. And we know that the enthalpy of reaction is the free energy minus T delta S. So this is just rewriting delta S. So given that, I can replace my free energies of reaction with the equivalent expression involving the standard cell potentials. That is, the entropy of reaction, the standard entropy of reaction, is NF partial derivative of the standard potential with respect to temperature. So those are things I could measure or, or look up because it is a standard potential. And similarly, I can uh, derive an expression for the enthalpy of reaction. And this is far more straightforward than calorimetry. Anybody who's ever done a calorimetry experiment knows how painful it is to lock down a bomb calorimeter, screw everything tight, ignite something of known uh, it burns to create a certain amount of heat, measure changes, it's a pain. Whereas running an electrochemical cell, nothing could be simpler. You have a little like, voltmeter that's reading volts. Um, well, some things could be simpler, but in any case, it's much nicer than uh, calorimetry. So it's a great way to assess some of these thermodynamic quantities. And so let's, uh, let's consider another way to exploit this. So again, I'll, I'll throw up my usual uh, cell reaction, two things on the left, two things on the right. Here is the Nernst equation, which allows you to determine the cell potential from the standard potential and the activities of all the different species. And so now, let me think about when the system is at equilibrium. So 
If it's at equilibrium, then there is no electromotive force. E is equal to zero. And so in that case, I can rearrange the equation, just move the second term in the Nernst equation over to the other side. So it's RT over NF log. Because it's at equilibrium, this is now the equilibrium constant expressed in activity units in this case. And if I want to solve for that constant, let me just rearrange, I'll get that the activity equilibrium constant is equal to the exponential of NF standard potential divided over RT. And so that can be terrifically useful if you would like to uh, predict, predict in the sense of just going and looking up in tables, what are the standard potentials? Solubility products for, say, sparingly soluble salts, acid dissociation constants for weak acids, and so forth. So let, let's take a specific example of that. Let's look at silver chloride. Okay, and so you'll remember that uh, we've actually seen these one of these half reactions before. We've looked at this one previously. So silver chloride solid reduced by an electron to make chloride in solution and silver solid. But now what I want to do is, here's an experiment that is hard to do and you'll see why in a moment. Put silver chloride salt in water right, and measure the concentrations of the aqueous silver cation and the aqueous chloride anion. They're actually tremendously low concentrations. This is used in photography, right? It's not a soluble thing. It precipitates out from solution. So in order to generate this reaction, I can take this half reaction, and now I need to cancel out my electrons, and I don't want to have solid silver anywhere, so I want to cancel out solid silver. So I'll take silver being oxidized, so I'm writing it in the reverse of the standard potential, to aqueous silver and an electron. And if I go and look up in a standard table, what is the standard reduction potential? It'll be 0 0.799. I'm writing it in oxidation mode, so it's negative 0 0.799. So now I can sum these two together, and I know that the net potential for this full reaction is minus 0 0.577. So let me now plug that into this equation. And uh, now what I'll call this is a special name. This equilibrium constant is a solubility product equilibrium constant, something one often sees in first year chemistry. So E to the single electron, so N is one, there's our Faraday constant, there's our worked out standard potential, minus 0 0.577 volts, uh, here is R, here is T, net, of, net result 1.77 times 10 to the minus 10th for the solubility product. And all this just from putting an elect, well actually we didn't even generate the cells, we just looked up what the standard potentials were. This is certainly a lot easier than trying to decant off a solution from, from silver chloride, pull off all the water, and measure maybe a microgram out of an entire liter of water. So very, very powerful technique, electrochemistry. All right, the train is continuing to pull us through this module. And next, what I want to look at is making a further connection with all the power of thermodynamics by defining ionic free energies of formation.